So I was in Alaska working at a, a little cafe. I met my now wife. She, it was a small cafe where one cook, I was a dishwasher. We had one waitress, waitress quit. We hired a new one. It was my now wife. Hmm. And so I saw her from the across the room and I was like, they make them like that? <laughs> <You> just knew. <laughs> what? And she was, I think she was six months pregnant at the time. We became friends. Um, we were always joking at work. And it came to a point to where her and her husband moved to Maryland. He was in the army, so they moved around a lot. We remained in touch. She went to Maryland. I moved to Arkansas, lived with my mom. I think I was 22 at the time. And I was do I was selling stuff on eBay, so I didn't have to get a job. I moved. I was living with my mom in Arkansas, and I had to get a job. I didn't want to get a job, um, so I just at that time I didn't know what I was doing, but I I I felt myself working for myself, so I knew what it felt like. I went to Walmart one day, like it's you know the days you least expect it. Went to Walmart and I was like, oh man, I haven't bought Pokemon cards in. 10 plus years. So I was like, I'm gonna buy some just to see what they look like nowadays. And I pulled a really good card and I was like, that's cool. I don't collect these anymore. So I just put it on eBay, ended up making twice of what I paid for the pack. Okay. And that's when it, We're on something. something hit you like, Light bulb. boom, there it is. <clears throat> and so I was like, okay. And so I started selling cards on eBay. It just, boom, here's your idea. So I, I was able to work from home. Um, at that point, um, Maria Gloria, my wife and her husband needed to both work, but they had a two-year-old autumn, my daughter now. Um, so I offered to be a nanny. So I watched her full time. They both worked full time. They were always gone and it was just me and autumn and we would hang out. I would do my Pokemon orders at night. She would help me with them by throwing them on the floor. And we did that for a while. And I eventually moved back to Arkansas. And then um, at that point, my wife and her husband were going through things. She moved back home here to California. And I was in Arkansas. And she was my best friend. And I've always wanted to live in California. And that was like, it's all I needed. Packed everything I had into my car and drove straight to California. And then eventually that led to me going to L.A. But... So That's you went to L.A. Here. to produ- uh, to pursue actual, like, stand-up comedy and the formal route where you go, you know, let's do movies and TV shows and that sort of thing. Tell me, yeah. tell me about that. What were you I going was, for? Uh, I was working at Yard House here in Roseville. Mm-hmm. And what's weird is I was, I was feeling that after about two years of working there, I was feeling that nudge of, like, I was doing YouTube at the time still, um, but feeling that nudge of, like, just do it. Hmm. You just got to, you got to jump. And I'm real big on burning your boats. Big on it. Explain that. I've In the sense that. of if you have a plan B, plan A is not working. Ooh. And that. So f- just all in. Yep. So. Uh, Lewis House has one of my favorite quotes on that. When you go all in, magic things happen. Absolutely. I, I remember when I was leaving Arkansas, I told my mom, I was 24, I think. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm not allowed to come back. And you cannot let me come back and live with you because that's, it's easy. You know, Mm. things don't work out. I can go live with my mother for free. I said, I'm not allowed. So I burned that boat and I was like, I got to make it in California or else. So I I was working at Yard House and I felt that urge of like, just, if you want to do YouTube, you got to do it. You can't work full time at Yard House Mm. and then expect YouTube to work. And then I, I just got to a point to where I was like, if I don't do something now, I will be 65 working in the same restaurant. And that was enough for me to say, burning the boats. Mm. I sold everything I owned except for a suitcase and a pillow. And I just went to LA. Okay. I didn't know. That is all in. That is all in. Yeah. I, I, I had nothing. I didn't know where I was going to live. I didn't know where I was going to sleep. But I knew. I try to, I try to tell this to people because people know I was homeless I put myself in that situation. I don't want to say that, you know, I fell on hard times and I was homeless because that's disrespectful to the people who actually have. Hmm. And I wasn't that. I purposefully chose to be homeless 
it was either work full time to live or work full time to pay for acting class, pay for improv school okay. and live uncomfortably. And then it would, it took maybe five months to where I couldn't afford to go to those classes anymore. So mm-hmm. now I'm just paying to be homeless. Like I'm just, I'm working full time <laughs> to remain homeless. <laughs> I don't know where it went. I was charging coffees to credit cards. I was 12,000 in debt, you know, 400 a month minimum payments. It was bad. Like I was really going through it and something clicked just like the burn your boats thing. This was after maybe a year year and a half or so to where I was like, I, I have to just go all in. Mm. And it was another one of those thoughts. It was almost like a promise or me saying to myself, I'm willing to live in my car for the next 15 years until I'm 40. If by the time I'm 40, I can live the life I want to live. I eventually came across, you know, I was doing YouTube and I was like, I got to switch it up. And I started putting on a thick accent. Mm-mm. Southern? Like, real Southern. Okay. And I, I did this growing up because most of my family's Southern. Sure. From Arkansas. So a lot of them have that that accent. So when we get going, we get that accent. And, I, <laughs> and so, but I was like, I'm going to make it real bad. Because I was like, nothing else works. Why not? And people liked it. And so I started doing those. And then I just started making videos about, you know, what happened at work. And it almost seemed like as the character, I came up with better jokes. Huh. So I was like able to think different. And so things would happen at work and I would make videos about it. And eventually, you know, something would happen at work. I'd make a video about it and it would, it'd get pretty popular. Like for me, like 50,000 views. My whole thing was people are suffering. Everyone is. Hmm. Cause at that point I was like, my life's good. I have great parents. I have a great life. I have, I work at a restaurant. I have food. I have all this. And I feel like I'm suffering. So there's people out there suffering. Hmm. So I knew that in some way, people just needed a release from life. Because I did. Because when you're off work and you live in your car, you go to your car and then you're just there. Uh, You don't have anywhere to go. Nowhere to be. So it's like mentally draining. So at that point, I was like, I want to be that for other people. So I got to that point where I was like, it needs to be daily. Because everyone needs something every day so i was like it has to be daily and i even if it wasn't good i was like i have to post and that was i think something i did for five years something like that daily a long time That's until awesome. we had our our son i think i i went daily until that point so i did that for yeah it was about a year and then i did one video about something that happened at work which was stupid on my end but it was funny i made a video about it Um, but I was so excited. It was one of those videos that I was like, I have to, and it was on my lunch break from work. And I was like, instead of eating lunch, I'm going to go film. So I went out and I was like, I filmed this video and right when I got done, I had to go right back into work. So I didn't get to eat that day. Mm. And I was so excited that I didn't take my uniform off. I was still in uniform. Mm -hmm. And that video was the one that kind of took off. It kind of took 200,000 views, which was wild. And I was like, this is crazy. I love it. And then I get a call from my boss saying that higher ups had seen it. Um, And it wasn't good. Mm. Um, They saw I had the logo. They sent me home for three days, brought me in after three days, gave me the ultimatum. Which was? If you delete all your videos. Oh, Oh, you can come back to work. Oh, and at this point, oh, that's a gut check. At this Just point, hearing I, was, that. I was like, it was tough because sick. this job was, I was paying my car off. I was paying my debt off every morning. I would go into work at six 30. I would come in at five 30 and journal. And I, you know, my saying was I'm financially free by December 23rd, 2018. Mm. Like that was my goal. And I, I wrote that down every day. And I was like, what three steps can I take today? And, and this job was like all those steps. Do this to get this pay raise. Do this. And I was paying my car off. I was paying my debt off. And so I was like, how can I leave this job? And then it just hit me. And it was like, I, I can't. Mm. So I told the guy, I said, 
I'm not willing to take down the things that I want to do in life to come back to work. And he said, fair enough. And that was it. Wow. So now I'm homeless and no job in L.A. And so I was, that's, you know, I, I did a video right after that of like getting fired and I was high about it. Like, you know, this is content. This is what I was meant to do. And then at some point, you know, that fear kind of sets in. Mm. It was weird how it all worked out. That was uh, end of August, beginning of September. I came back here. My wife was like, why don't you come here? Stay with us till you get back on your feet. I was like, I appreciate that. I came up here, still living in my car. I would watch Autumn, our daughter, while she worked. And then when she came home, I would film. Grinding. I, was I love grinding. this. I was there, like, there is no, you cannot cheat the grind. You can't no. cheat the grind anywhere in life. There's no free money. It wasn't Nothing overnight. worth having comes free. Yes. No. Yeah. It was, it was a lot and still doing daily. Mm. And, a, and a lot of things happened that I'm like really proud of. And that happened where I would make $3 a video. And I was like, that's enough to pay for my energy drink. I was over the moon. I've made a lot of money. Any income would the be. The $3 a video I made was the highest point ever. Hmm. I was like, it's been eight years. And now I'm making $3 a video. This is the greatest moment of my life. And so it was a month or so. And I was like, I got this idea. My, my wife went to um, a comedy show where she was performing. I was like, I'll watch Autumn. Leave her here. Everyone was gone. And I did this video where I was reacting to... Um, knitting so i tried this knitting tutorial Mm -hmm. and i was like (laughs) it was so different from what i had done but i was editing and i couldn't stop belly laughing i was like this is so funny i loved it and so i just uploaded it and it got a million views that day whoa and that was the video that started everything and the day after facebook was like do you want to start monetizing and i think i made six thousand dollars that month so yeah, I did that. Um, and it was September 22nd of 2018. Of course you remember it. Your life's never the same. Ever. Never the same. 6,000 in that month from that one video. And you had said, uh, December 2018 is when you're going to be financially free. So you, you beat it. I beat it. Okay. And I definitely was. Hmm. So, <laughs> I was, I had made more money by the end of December of 2018 than I had ever made in my entire life times a hundred. That's fantastic. It was fantastic. And And had you at that point uh, was giving back on your mind already? hundred percent. It was the the moment I realized I was making $6,000 that month. One of our nieces was having her quince. It was our first niece to have a quince. And I, I wasn't even a part of the family yet. I was just the friend. And I said, I'll give 800. Hmm. And I was like, I was just so overjoyed. I was like, I'll give it all away. And you felt, describe that feeling where you say like, I can tell when my heart wants to give, what does that feel like? And how does the circumstance show up? I, I think giving is extremely important. And I don't think True. people understand how much it impacts others and also what it's doing for you. And I think it's a way to experience heaven on earth. That feeling when yes. you impact someone for the better, whether it's monetary giving, time, you give your reputation, you give clout, advice, or whatever, I think it's the greatest feeling on earth. Yeah. It's the biggest dopamine rush yeah. that you can get. Yeah. And I don't know how to explain it. It's just like, it's almost like when the opportunity arises, you either feel gross or you feel let. It's not even like feeling good. It's sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll notice... I won't even know if someone needs money. It's just a feeling Mm. of like you're passing by. You notice you have a hundred in your pocket. Got it. I don't know what it is, but yeah, um, just finding those opportunities and giving wholeheartedly, but being smart and saying, if I give away all $6,000, I'm in the same spot. You know, it's not forever, but I knew it's, it's that knowing of like, if you give 800, you're going to be okay. Okay. So you got to be realistic too. Yeah. you. Def- yeah. I'm definitely realistic with my money, but it's also, you don't want to get to a point to where 
you don't give because you're worried you don't have enough hmm. because you're just projecting lack and you're just saying that's what you're putting out to I the don't universe. have it and so lack comes to you and I want to be sure that I'm open and say because there have been a lot of times where I was broke homeless and noticed someone needed money and I had maybe at that point they don't have the the belief that it will come to them again but at that point I did hmm so I know this hundred dollars, which is massive. It's food for me. I know it'll come back here. And then you just give, hmm. and, but without expectation. Yes. That's the biggest part. I, I noticed that anytime you give your time, your energy, your money to someone with expectation, resentment, nothing comes out of it, but resentment. Hmm. Yeah. And I've noticed a lot of that in content creation as well. I started giving content with expectation. Huh. Now I describe that a little bit. What was the expectation with your content? Views? Yeah. I got, okay. I got to a, a point, a really, really bad point mentally, maybe halfway into my, you know, 2021, 2022, around there, where I was, I was like, I... I would upload a video and it would perform how it performs, but I would be upset. Hmm. Be like, why is it doing this? Why is it not making money? It should do this. It should do that. These normally work. And I would get to a point and I did that for a long time, a couple years until one day I just took a step back and I was like, I'm, I'm not giving to give. I'm giving to receive. I was like, that's my problem. Oh, wow. That's oh. a brain blower. Yeah. And that wasn't until hmm. three, four months ago. Like that recent. And it, I haven't looked at one video view. I don't know how much money I make. I don't know how they perform. I, I went as far as to not read any comments either. Hmm. Just to get back to a, a place of good. And so my whole mentality has shifted to... I did this video because this is, you know, source, energy, whatever, the universe. Put it in my head. It sounded fun. I did it. I'm giving it. So it, it impacted the content you made as well. Did yeah. you go, did you get more aligned with, no, this is what I want to do. And now that I don't care what the results are, I'm making this. Yeah. Not so much what I want to do. Okay. But I was, I was making content because I was like, well, these work. These make the most money. Hmm. And I was like, well, that's not why I did this. It's like giving to someone on the street who needs it. You're not looking for them to give you anything back. You're just giving. So I'm, I'm applying that to my content again. So I don't know. Hmm. I mean, I'll do a video that's fun for me that may not have performed, but I won't know about it. I know I'm there. Hmm. So whatever happens next. It's supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm ready for whatever. If it's YouTube, then it's YouTube. If it's something else, then... I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your family life and marriage. And you guys are both high-profile people, okay? At the same time, you can still go in public places, and not everybody's going to come and, like, pull on your beard and ask for a selfie and shit. That's true. That's got to be cool. That's kind of like the best kind of famous, in a way. But... Still, you guys have to be married and have kids in the public persona. How do you balance privacy with transparency for your fans? Um, I think me and my wife do it different. She's very, has always been private. Hmm. Like, I'm going to show you who I am, but I'm also not even going to tell you I'm pregnant the entire time. And she kept our son's pregnancy a complete secret while doing content full time. So... I'm the opposite to where I'm like, I want to tell everyone what I'm thinking. <laughs> like, I want to be the openest book ever. Mm -hmm. And so that's who I am. And she's kind of reined me in a little bit because some people do take advantage of that. Um, parenting in public is difficult mm. because I think I have a lot to work on in the sense of when you're a parent, you have, you have to discipline your children. Like you have to tell them no. And sometimes you have to be stern. It's hard. And sometimes your kids are throwing a tantrum because they're three and autistic and they don't mm -hmm. understand the word no and have meltdowns. 
N no one knows that. Hmm. No one knows my life. And it's tough because I overthink it in the sense of people will see us. Oh, these YouTubers. Of course, their kids are brats. Hmm. And I overthink it. I'm a people pleaser, so I care what people think all the time. So it's tough when stuff like that happens. So I have a lot to work on on that end of not caring what people think. That's hard. And also, like, how do I... How do I go about disciplining my children in public or like handling a tantrum? Sometimes you got to pick up the kid and the kid's punching you in the face because you, you, they don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. And I'm just worried that everybody's judging me. So you feel up to talking about the autism situation a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Do you, how long bit. ago, Jameson, right? Mm -hmm. How long ago was he diagnosed and what kind of things did you notice that made you even want to look into that? It wasn't until he was around nine, 10 months that I started noticing he, like, he wouldn't look at you. Okay, he so eye contact yep. was an issue. Yeah, he wouldn't look okay. at you. He wouldn't respond. Like, you could be in his face saying his name, and it's just, all of this is more important around. So I was like, that's weird. Hmm. So I suspected he had something. Um, and he was, a, he was really delayed in anything, verbal communication, stuff like that. So I brought it up to my wife and she was very hesitant about it. Like, no. Yeah. It's like, tough to even look It's like... hard to just say, oh yeah, our kid, our kid's probably autistic. Sure. I absolutely understand. I had gone through that privately and did the research. And so it wasn't until, you know, way down the road, he was... 17 months where he was hitting all the milestones, crawling, walking, everything. I mean, motor skills on top of it, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't look you in the eye. He wouldn't respond to his name. He would walk on his tippy toes. He lined cars up in a row and he would lay on the floor and just look at the wheels. Hmm. And I was like, that's not, that's not normal. I was like, it ha he has, I want to check it I, just to be sure. But then you know, talking to my wife and she was like, no, like it's fine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I, I haven't been teaching him. So I went through this whole thing of like, oh, it's my fault. I haven't even been teaching him words. Oh, wow. He's 19 months. And I was like, so for months we would go out and I'd be like, like tree, this is blue ball. And I would like everything we interacted with, I would talk to him and it's still nothing. So we took him in, we went through the process, which is incredibly insane. Of to get the, di to get to get the diagnosis. Assessed. Okay. Yes. You, you have to be diagnosed to get any care at all. Hmm. So you can go through the state and it's free, but it takes six, nine months just to oh, get yeah. an and appointment. And he's at that crucial developmental age too. Yeah. You don't want to wait six to nine months. And I was like, I can't, I can't wait. I want to know. And I would, I'm blessed to be in a position to be able to do things out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So I researched, I, I found, um, a place in Sacramento who will out of pocket, you could pay and get a diagnosis. So we did, we went the next week and he got diagnosed severe autism. They did a bad job explaining that, you know, it's severe because one, he's not speaking full sentences, but he's 19 months who at 19 months is speaking full sentences. Okay. He's not doing these things. So the assessment's weird. So we went in, we immediately signed him up for a therapy, um, speech therapy. Um, he was doing, it's behavioral therapy, which I know a lot of people don't like, but I, I did a lot of vetting. My wife did a lot of vetting of this school. It's like play. People in the, like the autistic parenting community don't like it? Or like people who just don't understand it because okay. it, it got a bad rep. In the past, ABA therapy has gotten a bad rep, you know, of abuse and oh. giving kids with autism trauma later on in life. I've sat through a lot of his sessions. So as my wife, he plays and they teach. And that's all it is. And it is excellent. He can't wait to go. He hates coming home. He loves it. He's three now. Um, he's going to preschool next year. And... He, he's in love with vehicles and that's the only thing he talks 
Like he'll. All right, let's do vehicles. Let's if go. If it's vehicles, man, it is vehicles. So he's he's all over planes, helicopters, trains, mm. cars, and he knows them by name, all of them. He'll he'll will be inside and he hears something fly by. Oh wow! And he'll say helicopter, run outside, and it's a helicopter. And wow. so he he loves his stuff, and I I've seen him grow a lot, and I think we don't know where it's gonna go. I mean, he he has a global and developmental speech delay, which which means it could come later. Mm. I mean, he's he's talking up a storm. Half the time, I don't know what he's saying, but he's talking. And so I I think a lot of the pain of in the beginning of like what what does parenting look like with a son with autism is kind of faded. In the if we have to keep him with us for the rest of our lives, like what a blessing. Mm. So like, I think yeah. we're in a good spot with it. I, I, that's awesome, man. I was going to ask you, what are your favorite parts of, of him having autism? You know, like <laughs> he, there's gotta be some cool, unique things that are just a way to bond with a kid that other people aren't experiencing. Like, for example, like that, if my, if my daughter heard a plane going overhead, she goes, that's a 747 dual engine or whatever. Yeah. I'd be like, that's awesome. <laughs> that is pretty sweet. Yeah. I actually started flying helicopters, practicing, like taking lessons, because he's so into planes, helicopters. Can you imagine like that? that? Dad takes him on a helicopter ride. It's oh. the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but I'm learning how to fly helicopters. Okay. But I don't know. It's, it's so different from, you know, raising another child, neurotypical, and then raising Jameson who is just completely different, mm -hmm. but not in a bad way, not in a different weird way. Just different. It's just different. And you're like, I'm experiencing so many aspects of being a dad. There's so much silver lining in, in this with everything you just said. Do you ever feel like guilt in a way that it came from potentially your, your child suffering? I, I experienced that with my situation. Like, All the time. And then I... Yeah, you, you mentioned you went through the self-blame. Like, could this be my fault? I went through the same thing there. And um, yeah, I lost my train of thought a little bit. Yeah, it's... Well, how did you how did you deal with that? Wondering if it's my fault? Yeah. Um, well, to give a little context on what happened. So my daughter, uh, she got diagnosed with cancer. She grew a tumor out of her arm. Uh, we've had two surgeries, got it all out. She lost a good chunk of her arm, so there's a little mobility issues. But... She's clean. Her genetics are mapped. She doesn't have anything predisposed. There's no reason that That's should awesome. have been there. I don't, I don't understand. But we did spend four days where we thought it was stage four, and we're prepping on how do we tell her, how do we tell her sister, and that whole different story there that shook us up. But I went through like, oh, okay. There's still a little emotion behind it. <laughs> You're making me cry I, yesterday yeah. when you were telling me about yeah. it. I was like, don't tell me this yeah. on the podcast. <laughs> so I went through thinking okay, we don't know how this is here. Did I like, uh, did I put too much stress on her? You know what I'm saying? And wow. so, which I shared that with a doctor and she really helped me. She's like, this is no, 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 that is not how childhood cancer works. This is a one in 3 billion thing. It, this is random and it's terrible, but if you do this right, good will come of it. But I still wonder that sometimes if I discipline her now, I'm like, is she going to grow another tumor? Because I was just too rude. But yeah, um, I had to basically treat it like any other nonsense trauma thought would come in. Just like, hey, I, there's no way that yeah. I would. And, you know, there's just no way that that's from me. And, yeah. you know, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's that's how I handle it is because it still comes in. Um, and I just say not not going to let that thought root. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, you were telling me that yesterday. Um the the part that got me i got off the phone and i was just crying i was like god why would you tell me that <laughs> so, it's so it's so hard it's heavy to drop on people i never know when to share it and when not to and i always try to say immediately we're fine now she's you good know? yes but it was the point you told me like how do we break it to how are we going to tell her sister yeah, i was, was like well Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> How dare... Like, why? Yeah, I didn't need to know about your yeah, family. I'm trying to make content I don't here. care anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what it is since being a dad or a vitamin deficiency, I've mm -hmm. become 
I just <laughs> over the smallest things, I'm like, that's that's gonna make me cry. Yep, yep. And I was like, I wasn't this person before, but you have kids and you just, yeah. Well, I, I do want to ask as we wrap it up, but I like, what does your manifestation process look like? Um, sure. Well, first, actually, let me ask. Anything else you want to share on on that topic? Like maybe listeners that are just finding out they have an autistic child or wondering, any, any message of hope, input? I, I don't know if anything I can say can cut through. Hmm. I don't know. Because well, I heard a lot from a lot of people. But it's... At that moment, it's not me. It's not my kid. It's you and it's your kid. It's your life. Listening to some dude say, oh, you're going to be fine. Mm. Is it helpful? But if I can say something, it nothing about it is bad. Mm. Oh, that's going to get me. <laughs> that, that's, that's it. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And you can even find good in it. Yeah. I wouldn't change it. <laughs> that's incredible. And as we sit here and cry... <sighs> I'll tell you my manifestation process. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will try to condense it. Sure. I think it's very simple how I do it now. Um, I will say if there's something I want. I'll do it with everything. Right now, say I, I, something small like I'm going in for a helicopter lesson. They're very dangerous. Yeah. It's very... They want to find the ground as fast as possible. That's what <laughs> helicopters do. That's and <laughs> so learning is tough. So for something as small as I hope I go home safe, I, I, I normally show up early. I sit in the parking lot. Um, it's always easiest to do it with my eyes closed. But I imagine myself walking out. And then the feeling I feel mm. of like, that was the best I've ever flown. And not just say it, but like, sit there until it's like, oh, like I feel joy. It's like almost behind your eyes. Like I feel the joy of like, like I'm learning. I did great. Is that a skill you have to develop or where oh, you can yeah. actually produce the feeling of an event that hasn't happened? Cause I, I like the easiest way they say to start is with gratitude. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what the hell does gratitude feel like? I mean, what am I supposed to be feeling? And yeah. people just say, hey, keep doing it. It will happen. It, is that Was that the case for you? Did it take a little training? It took a lot of time. Okay. Um, a big goal, I think the biggest goal I've ever had was I want to make $1 million in one calendar year. And that was back early on in content. But I can tell you I knew what it felt like to hit a $1 million to make it before I did it. Hmm. And you won't until you feel it. Hmm. because that's the whole point you're you're vibrating whatever you're putting out is coming back in so if i if i have this goal that i want to come home safe from helicopter training i'm gonna feel grateful and feel excited and pumped that i did an excellent job and i'm walking back to my truck and then let go hmm. don't even think about it when you're in the helicopter don't think about it okay you just have to let it go so that's what it is on something small. And then I do that anytime. I did that before I came here, that I just want it to go good. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it doesn't go. Sometimes you think it's going to go a certain way, but then you realize I had expectation and then you cut that off. If, if you're wondering why things aren't manifesting or coming to you, but you're, you're like, I'm, every morning for an hour, I'm visualizing. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling the feeling an hour straight every day. That may be true. But after you get up from that meditation and that feeling, there's 18 hours of you flipping people off in traffic, mm. feeling resentment, going back to blaming. So you're, you're not feeling it the majority of the time. So you're getting what you put out the majority of the time. And that's more like the law of attraction, right? So, much, yeah. okay. So I, I try to live in it. So early on when I wanted to be, like I wanted to be successful at flying helicopters, Mm -hmm. I'd walk around feeling what it felt like to be a helicopter pilot. When I was in my car, I would walk around what it felt like to be a famous YouTuber. Hmm. I'd walk into stores and like feel that feeling. It's like it sits here in your heart and then it's right here behind your eyes. It's like gratefulness. You feel grateful for the thing already and then you let it go. And then when you notice you're not on it anymore, 
get back to it, you feel it, and then just go about your life. And then mm. it's those moments where you're not expecting, you're not noticing, you just let go and you're living your life, an opportunity comes up. Okay. And it's that light bulb that connects the two. This opportunity, this goal. And you're like, got it. You're setting a goal, and I assume you have to get very clear on exactly what you want or, or not. Um, I used to. Okay. I think now I, I don't assume I know better than the universe. Mm. So it's like, if you want oh. this promotion. Oh, that takes so much pressure off. I've done so much writing. I need to be uh, in blue socks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I was there where you journal about everything, yes. every aspect of it, mm. the vision board. And I'm like, what if I don't know best? What if, what if I'm mid tier compared to what could be? So most of the time, like I made all these big money goals because mm -hmm. I wanted to feel a certain way. I was like, why don't I just feel a certain way and see, see what money comes to me? Mm -hmm. So I've started doing that and I've never made a million in a calendar year. I've made a lot more. Oh. <laughs> so, so if, if you would have put that cap on it. If I would have made a million a year and been happy, but I, you never know what's around the corner. Mm. You may want this job opportunity, but what are you, what's the feeling? Get that feeling, not the outcome. Live in that feeling, and the perfect outcome will come your way. It'll be something you don't even think about. Do you think about that goal constantly? A million dollars in a calendar year, so you're walking around, or you focus on the feeling? Of... Nope. I walk around with it. So I... Okay. I, I walk in a store knowing I can, I know the, the biggest feeling I had, I remember when I was just starting to make money, I would walk around, um, my wife's, she lived in a trailer park. I'd walk around every morning and I'd walk with the sense of how great does it feel that I could buy that? Hmm. I could have all of these. Before you could. I couldn't. And then the next month I could. And then I would feel it again. And then the next month it was more. And it was just, you live in it. So if I'm walking around Walmart, I'm like, I could own a Walmart. Hmm. What would it feel like to own a Walmart? What would it feel like to have $10 million? Get that feeling, live in it. If it goes away, get it back. And then just live, live your life. Okay. Say yes to things. Go have fun. Hmm. And that's what I've been doing. Saying yes to helicopters. I don't know why. I don't know what it's going to come up <laughs> saying yes to all these things. And then eventually it's going to click Dude. or 10 years down the road. You're going to be in the house with $10 million having a good time. And it's going to click. Oh, I wanted this. Mm -hmm. I wanted this mm -hmm. exact thing. I'm in blue socks. Yes. That happens a lot to people. Yeah. So uh, to anyone listening, that's like skeptical or have never heard of this stuff oh, like me course. a couple of years ago. Where do you think is the best place for them to start to go learn about how, how manifesting works, the specific steps and techniques? I think it depends per person. Hmm. For me, I'm very analytical. I don't want to hear woo-woo stuff. I don't want to hear horoscope. I don't want any of that. I want the logic. How do you know? And the best thing I found is uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yeah. That's that's right. Just listen to him. Just go to YouTube welcome. and you can have a free stuff PhD lesson. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. And he's so charismatic too. He's so easy to he's listen so to. He just sucks you in. To. Yeah. Just, wow. And he backs it up with proven science. So if you're skeptical, proven science always works. And then just branch out and have fun and learn other things. But if you're really like, oh, that doesn't work, just listen to him. Hmm. It's proven and then go from there. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, leave a comment, show these guests some support. What part impacted you the most so it would make them feel really good. These are real stories and raw emotions. Thank you.